Hi, my name is Justin Jaquith, and my wife Angela and I are the pastors of the House Guadalajara, and we just want to say welcome to our online service this week. I think this is the maybe 11th week, more or less, that we've been doing this, and I know many of us have met in person, but if not, if this is your first time watching our services, you are more than welcome. We're so happy to have you join us. And uh, our, our goal every week really is to talk a little bit about the Bible, to share a few things kind of from our heart, different ones of us share each week. Um, and I think really there's a lot to be said for taking a few minutes, whether it's a Sunday morning, wherever you're at, or maybe even sometime during the week, taking a few minutes just thinking about and reflecting on what God means to you and who God is in your life. And I know that for each of us, that's, uh, that's very different. There's different answers to that question. So whatever your spiritual journey or your spiritual background might be, please know from my heart, from my family, we're just happy uh, to have this chance to share a few things, and I hope it, hope it means something to you. I hope you're able to, um, to really enjoy it. Uh, it's obviously weird times, crazy times for everybody. I don't think that that could be said anymore. We're all very aware of it. Uh, we don't know at what point we'll be back together physically. So in the meantime, take advantage of the fact that this is online and digital. Grab a cup of coffee grab some breakfast. Maybe you're already watching this in bed, eating breakfast, wherever you're at. Um, I, I know you're going to enjoy it. I want to share a few things from the Bible and a few thoughts that I think are, um, for me at least, have been, have been very helpful recently, some things I've been thinking about. So I just want to read a passage in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I'm going to read the first, actually 13 verses. And as I read, try to imagine, try to think about the meanings of these words in your head. It's a list. You'll see uh, it's a very famous passage. I'm sure you've heard it probably many times. Um, but as I, as I read, Try to kind of imagine the, the author of this, of this poem. It was poetry. It may or may not have been set to music, but it was, it was intentionally written with a very lyrical feel. And I want you to try to imagine kind of what was in his mind as he was penning these words several thousand years ago. Um, this was King Solomon writing, and he says this, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. He says, A time to be born and a time to die. So think about just the difference in these sets of words. A time to be born and then a, a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, which that's probably quarantine lockdown. A time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And then he, he goes on, and I, he probably could have listed a lot more pairs of words, but that gives you a, a really wide perspective, I think, of this idea of there being different seasons, different moments, different times when certain things are appropriate. And he goes on to say, what do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything, and this is God, God has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also said eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there's nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. So it's a beautiful passage very reflective passage on, um, on timing and on seasons. I think where we are right now in the entire world is a very, very unique season, obviously, but really it's just a season. We know it's going to end. Many more seasons will come in our lives, but I want to I talk a little, about, a little bit about this idea of timing and this idea of, um, of waiting, but I, I almost hesitate to use that word because the, the idea isn't so much that we wait. The time is, excuse me, the, the idea is more about being aware of the season that we're in and how we can continue regardless of that season. And I'd like to pray to get started. If you would, if you want to join me wherever you're at, go ahead and close your eyes. And we're just going to uh, start this time with a, a real quick prayer. Lord, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives, even though we don't always see it. We don't always understand what's happening. Um, maybe some of us are going through issues right now, emotional issues or financial issues. Lord, you know what those are. You know the beginning, you know the end from the beginning. You know the seasons that we're living in. And we just ask that you would give us, even in these few moments we have together, you, you give us an understanding into where we are, into what lies ahead. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So probably at least a year ago, my wife 
told me that someday I should try yoga and I laughed and I resisted because I've never been a flexible person. Um, I've been always the opposite of flexible. I remember in high school, my soccer coach, like literally trying to almost sit on my, on my legs, you know, doing a little butterfly thing with your legs where they're kind of like that and trying to sit on them and could never get my legs to go down. I mean, they're just like up in the air like this. So she, she's like, we should do yoga. And I was like, no, um, I like going to the gym. I like running, but yoga, never going to try that. Well, you know, we've been stuck in our house for weeks now. So probably you, just like me, probably all of us have tried a few new things, a few things that we always kind of thought maybe someday we might try or maybe thought we would never try. And so yoga is one of those. So a couple weeks ago, my wife and I decided to start doing some yoga videos, just following some, some YouTube videos and some friends, some friends of hers uh, that, are, that, that have sent us YouTube videos. So anyway, um, we, I think we did about maybe two or three that were relatively relatively nice, like relatively calm, and I survived. I didn't pull any muscles. Uh, definitely am not more flexible now than 30 years ago or whenever I was in high school. Um, probably less flexible. But we probably at the third or the fourth time, we were like, we're getting this, we're good. Uh, we know some of the poses, so we're gonna try a hard one. We're gonna try one that's a little more intense. It had, I think, the word power in the title. And just a tip, if you try yoga, uh, don't start with ones that say power. Start with ones that say slow or like rest, but power and yoga, um, they're, they're, they're not a good mix. So anyway, we started and it was this, the sweetest instructor. She was like just a soft spoken and, and young and smiley and like a really sweet voice and talk kind of slow. And so she's like, yeah, so first of all, you're just going to sit down on your mat. You know, it's okay if you can't, and she's, you know, just super disarming the way she talked. So we were going through the whole thing and we were doing pretty good for like 10 minutes. You know, we were, we were doing these poses. Um, I mean, more or less doing these poses, you know, give us a break. It was our, one of my first times. But anyway, we were, I felt like I was doing pretty good. And then it just kind of got worse. It just got like more and more um, sadistic, I think is the word I would like to use. And you know, she never changed her tone of voice. She's like, okay, now you're gonna, you're gonna lift your legs straight up in the air and you're gonna hold them that way for 30 minutes. Okay, it wasn't that bad, but it felt like it. So we were, it was just getting harder and we were pushing through and you know, the pain was, was, was real. And then she gets this one place and I am not exaggerating. She's like, okay, you're gonna take, um, you're gonna take your, your right ankle and you're gonna, you're gonna lift it up and you're gonna wrap it around the inside of your left elbow. And I just looked at Angela and I'm like, I can't do that. Like my leg and those are opposite corners of my body. And then, so then she does it. So, you know, I halfway, halfway tried. And then she's like, now you're gonna take your left leg and you're gonna wrap it around your right elbow. And I'm thinking this is defying the laws of gravity and physics. This is impossible. And yet she did it. So she was all like, like tangled up. She looked like a pretzel. Actually, she looked more like a ball of Oaxaca string cheese. Like you couldn't tell what started and what ended where. It was just this like ball with like hands sticking out the front and then feet sticking out the bottom somehow. I don't even know what she was standing on because her legs were wrapped around her elbows, but just like this little figure. And then she, and then she said, because it got worse. She's like, okay, now you're just gonna lean forward on your hands and lift your feet up in the air and balance on your hands. And so she did it. So she was like on her hands, the rest of her string cheese body was sticking up in the air. And so I, of course, had to try it because I wasn't going to not try it. And I did not look like a ball of elegant string cheese with hands and yoga pants. I looked more like the nachos that you pour on, the cheese you pour on your nachos at the movie theater. Just like all over the ground. Um, didn't work. I was sore for like three or four days after that. And we still haven't had the, the nerve to go back and try that video again. One of these days we will. I probably will never balance on my hands the way she did. But um, I, we just had to laugh because it's... It was this soft-spoken, quiet, you know, this flow and like everything was slow and everything was peaceful. And, that, and then somehow she ended up in this position that required an amazing amount of strength. And for those that have been doing yoga a long time, this is nothing new. But for me, it was a bit of a revelation that there is a strength that comes in slowness. The two aren't, they're not opposites. They actually go together really well. The idea of of slow, the idea of, of being deliberate, of taking your time. And I think if there's one thing, well, there's probably many things, but one of the things we've all been 
noticing, maybe as we're stuck in our house so much, is kind of the difference in pace. Even though, I don't know about anyone else, I'm working as much or more as before, because it's all online, but I'm, I'm not driving 100 miles an hour around the city. I'm not stressed out about getting places on time. It's almost like the pace of life has slowed down. And it, it was interesting, as we were doing these yoga exercises, and then afterwards, um, recovering <laughs> with our muscles so sore, and, and realizing there's a strength, there's a power, there is actually a growth that happens in, in your physical body when you slowly move through a progression of, of exercises and you are intentionally connecting even with different parts of your physical body. I think the same thing happens in life. I think that slow is often underrated because we tend to associate muscles and in the physical world and uh, you know, being in shape and being fit with with speed and with sweats and with work and with a heart racing and pumping. And, you know, there's times for that. And I still like to run and there's still a place for cardio and all those things. But I, I think that even in our, in our day-to-day lives, I think there's a strength that we will find when we learn how to live slowly. And by slowly, I don't mean in a lazy way. I don't mean in a, in a light kind of disconnected or unrealistic way. And that was, you know, the, the thing that really struck us about these exercises with yoga is how much strength they actually required, how much strength it takes to be slow. And as I read this passage in Ecclesiastes, and there's, there's many more I could have chosen, but I, I read this one because it, it talks about the different times. There, there's a time to do everything. There is a time to run. There is a time to work really hard. There's a time for adrenaline to kick in. You know, there's a, there's a time for, um, for hearts to, to pump and to race and for us to, to rush and to hurry. There, there are times like that, but there are just as many times where we need to actually rest and wait and work, but in a, in a, at a different speed with a different level of intensity. And I want, to, I want to talk about a few observations, just a few, I actually wrote down three, three phrases that I want to explain briefly. Um, and they're, they're more or less inspired by this passage in Ecclesiastes, but also a few other verses that, uh, I'll read a couple of them. And then honestly, throughout the Bible, you, you, you find all these references to perseverance and to waiting and to patience and to holding on and to bearing up and bearing under. There's, a, there's like, I don't know, 15 or 20 probably different phrases in the Bible that are, that are used to describe the idea of, of kind of just going slow and steady through life. And I want to talk about a few few of those phrases. And the first one is this, it's go slow to go far. I want to talk about going slow to go far. And then after that, I want to talk, I'll give you the the other two just up front here. The second one I want to talk about is growing into your ears. And I'll explain what I mean by that, growing into your ears. And then the third one, I want to talk about writing chapters, not books. Then I'm just going to take a couple minutes on each one of these. And by couple, I mean probably like 10, but it, it'll be interesting. It'll be fun. Um, I want to talk about these, these three different kind of perspectives or facets of what it means to, to slow down, um, but not to stop. And there's a big difference there. We're not stopping. We're not disconnecting from life. We're actually slowing down um, because we, we want to go far. So talking again about that phrase, go slow to go far. If you've ever seen a long distance runner, you know the difference between a sprint and a marathon. Um, and it's often talked about a sprint is right out of the gate. You're going as fast as you can. Uh, everybody's cheering. Everybody's watching. It's, it's literally as fast as you can go because it's hundred meters, you know, or 50 meters, or maybe, maybe 500 meters at the most or something like that. But a marathon, it's a whole different mindset. You know, when a marathon starts, no one even really cares. I mean, they do, but it's really not a big deal if you're in the front or not. As a matter of fact, a lot of times the strategy is to kind of hang back and let someone else set the pace. And the same goes for other sports. Like if you're into football, American football, um, or basketball or baseball, if you like any of those, any sport like that, for the most part, they take two or three hours uh, to watch the game. So actually basketball, probably maybe probably two hours, maybe a little more than two hours. Um, soccer, what, maybe close to two hours as well. Football is slower, like three hours, and baseball takes like 30 or 40 hours. I'm just kidding. I don't like baseball. I get bored. But anyway, it's at least three hours as well. Um, and they've actually done, like, with a stopwatch, timed how much time the ball is actually in play in American football. And in a three-hour game, it's in play around 11 minutes. And in baseball, there's actually, m- like, real play happening for maybe, like, 18 minutes. The rest of the time, people are just changing positions and moving around. Anyway, that has nothing to do with this message. 
But the point is, when you start a three-hour game or when you start a two-hour game, you know, both as a, as a player and as a spectator, that there's a lot of game ahead. And so maybe your team is down by a point or down by five points or seven points in football or down by a run or down by whatever score you're looking at. You, you don't stress out too much. Why? Because there's a lot of game left. The point isn't to win now. The point isn't to put everything out there now. The point is to give it all over the course of the entire game. And the, thing, the same thing goes for life. We're not in this to just get a win in the next two weeks. We're in our life to, to win over the course of our life. So we go slow because we want to go far. We go slow because there's a lot of race left. We don't know how much. I wish we did. You know, I wish we knew if we had 20 years left or 10 years left or 50 years left. We don't, we don't know, but we can, we can assume on average that we have several decades left, probably most of us. And so that, that amount of time, you, know, you're not gonna, you don't have to get all the victories done. You don't have to get the business built. You don't have to conquer every weakness in your life. You don't have to learn everything you can in the next six months. But over the course of your life, you're going to be amazed how much you build, how much you learn, how much you change. That is, that's the beauty of continually pressing forward. So you don't stop. You don't go backwards. You don't give up. You simply go slow. You go forward at a steady pace day after day, week after week, year after year for the rest of your life. And I, I think you know, part of this might be a personality issue. Maybe some of us are more... Um, you know, go-getters, and we just want to get things done and then move on to something else, and that's fine. That's a, that's, there's, a, there's strength in that, and other people are a little more methodical, and they, maybe they want to just do the same thing really well for a long time, and there's a lot to be said for that as well. So whatever your personality is, um, you kind of have to apply this to your life whatever way makes the most sense. But I think that the, for me anyway, the revelation has been that I don't have to, I don't have to put undue stress, a, a selfish like self-focused stress on myself to accomplish really anything right away. The, the point isn't right away. The point is long-term. And obviously in these games, you know, the last few minutes, everybody's on the edge of their seat. I mean, depending on the game, but you're, you're watching, you're hoping, you're praying, you're shouting, you're screaming, you're hoping that your team's going to win. And at that point, yes, every moment of that entire game mattered. Every play, every point, they, they do matter. They do matter. So every moment we live matters. Every victory, every step forward, they're important and they do matter. But it's not like we have to do it all right now. We, we go slow because we're going to go far. Because God has called us to go far. The Bible says that the good works that we're going to accomplish, He already has them written down. He knows what they are. It's not like we have to figure something out or make something up or make something happen. God has called you and He's called me. He's given us an ability and a gifting to accomplish a ridiculous amount in our life, but it's over the course of our life. And he is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the one that gives us both the will and the, the desire, the, the will and the ability to do what he's called us to do. And I think there's a rest that comes in that knowledge and just knowing, hey, where I'm at right now is good. It's not where I'm going to be. It might not be where I want to be, but it's, it's good. It's worth celebrating. And I'm going to push a little harder and I'm going to try some new things and I might try to stand on my hands, but I probably won't. And I might be sore for a couple of days if I accidentally push things a little too hard or maybe because I stretched in an area I wasn't used to. Maybe in business, maybe in, in your health, maybe with a, an area where you're trying to overcome a character weakness, maybe in your education. There's areas where we're, we're moving forward and we just, we just can't get frustrated if the advance isn't as fast as maybe we expected. The second thing I wanted to mention here, um, well, let me, let me read um, a verse real quick. Luke 2.52. Um, I have it here in Spanish, so, but it's, I think I don't know in English. It says, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in grace with God and man. And when, it, when the Bible talks about this, Jesus was a boy at this point. It says, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in grace with God and man. And I've always loved that verse because Jesus is God. And so it's a little hard for us to capture this because obviously God doesn't change. So in his divinity, nothing happened. It wasn't like God got bigger. It wasn't like God learned something new. That would be impossible. But in his humanity, Jesus the man, Jesus the physical human being that lived and walked this earth, he grew in wisdom and in stature. That means physically. He grew in his, in his mind and in his stature. And he grew in grace and in favor with the people around him. It was a, it was a holistic growth. 
And that was what I, I mentioned earlier. I said the second point is, is going to be grow into your ears. The reason I had that picture in my brain is because we got a puppy a few weeks ago, uh, a couple months ago now. His name's DJ. He's a corgi. Um, if you know anything about corgis, they have very funny body types. They're, they're not like a normal shaped dog. It actually looks like someone took a rabbit um, and kept the back end because he has no tail and his rear is just this big round thing. And his nose and the ears are just gigantic. And then it looks like they took a rabbit and just like stuck a dog body in the middle of it. Like that's what our dog looks like. He's about this big, somewhere in there, growing every day. Um, it's so much fun. And his ears are just enormous. And when we first got him, they were floppy. They just, they hung down. And the vet said, hey, they're gonna, they're gonna stand up. Don't worry about it. Don't try to make him stand up on their own. His ears will, will get stronger and stand up. And they did, like three days later. Um, one of them stood up. So he's walking around with one ear up and one ear flopping. And then a few days later, all of a sudden the other ear just popped up. And then a few days went by and he kept getting bigger and his ears got bigger. And all of a sudden one flopped down again. And then it, a couple days later, it was back up. And then, and then the other one's down. And it's just been this funny like process of growth as his, his ears and his body and his no, I mean, his paws are huge. He can't even hardly move his back in because it's so heavy. So it's, it's just the funniest thing. He's a puppy. It's, it's awkward. It's supposed to be awkward. It's like an adolescent body. You know, he just, he just can't quite get everything to work in the same synchronized. And um, the idea that kind of came to me as I was thinking about that is, is this idea that we have to grow holistically. We have to grow in proportion to our ears. In, in proportion to whatever part of our body that's kind of leading the way. In his case, it's his ears. Um, and, and I actually like that metaphor of ears, too, because to me, ears represent what you, what you learn. They represent what you hear. So there's a lot of, about life that this dog doesn't know. We're teaching him some tricks. He's learning a few things. But he definitely knows his name. He definitely knows our voices. And you can see it when you say something to him. His ears just perk up. He starts moving his head. He doesn't totally know what to do yet. And sometimes he falls over trying to stand up. But his, his body and his habits and his training and his, his physical abilities and really everything about him will, will catch up to his years. And if I could just make kind of a, kind of a figurative um, application of that to our, to our lives. To me, it's this idea of growing as we follow our wisdom, as we follow what we hear and what we learn. So a lot of times I think we get so excited about doing and about having and about making a certain amount of money or finishing a certain project. But really the Bible talks so much about this growth in the area of wisdom. And it's almost like wisdom leads the way. As we grow in our understanding in our relationships, for example, we are able to have better relationships. As we grow in our understanding of marriage, an understanding of love and of forgiveness and of generosity, those, that, that understanding leads the way and we begin to step into it. And it would be an, it'd be an error. It would be, be a mistake to kind of force things to happen in life when we don't really totally know what we're doing yet. Now, it happens at the same time. It's, it's not like you can just sit back and, okay, I'm going to learn everything and know everything and be perfect and never make a mistake and then, and then go out and try it. I mean, that's not realistic either. Sometimes you try by fail or you learn by failure. Sometimes you grow by failure, and that's totally normal. Um, it's not much fun, but it's, it's, it's part of life. So I guess what I'm trying to say here with all this is this idea of holistic and proportional growth. We go slow to go far, but we also grow wide, and we grow in lots of areas at the same time. Life is more than just getting something done. So, so many times we want to have our to-do list. We want to have this objective and these goals. And we, we already have these expectations. And we think that's the definition of my success. That's the goal. And yet God's view of us is it's holistic. He's looking at us saying, wow, that's so cute. You're trying to get across the yard and you just fell on your face. You know, and he's like, oh, he'll grow into it. He'll, he'll learn how to do that again. I just feel like God wants us to kind of take the pressure off sometimes. Now, we obviously have to get up and run across the yard. We have to do those things and try those things. And sometimes we're going to fail, but we're going to grow in the process. And if we can grow with kind of our ears up, just listening and learning and gathering and understanding, we're, we are going to see growth. We're going to see things change. If you study um, even the way, the way the brain works, if you want to learn a new, a new area, I was reading this the other day, I don't remember even where, but it, it, to learn a new, like a brand new area, your brain actually has to create new pathways. Like it physically has to change for you to understand areas that are, that are drastically different from what you already know. 
that's kind of why we just we learn things progressively because your brain is literally extending itself and building these pathways and these little whatever they are neuron pathways in your brain and I, I think that sometimes in again in our life that's that's really what's happening we can't learn overnight I mean, we can have an understanding. We can have a revelation. We can get like this, this flash of inspiration. But let's be honest, most of what we know, it's the result of days and weeks and months and years and sometimes decades of applying ourselves and just incrementally growing in our knowledge, in our skill, in our humility, in our strength of character, in our emotional intelligence. That's, that's a God thing. God will actually, I believe, keep us from moving too fast because he wants us to grow holistically. And I, I mention it because if there is an area where maybe you've actually felt, I don't know, maybe condemned, maybe guilty, like inferior to someone else, because you look around you and well, they're doing it. They're able to make this area of their life function. They're able to see success and victory. And why, why can't I? Well, maybe you just haven't quite grown in that area yet. Or maybe there's some other area that you don't see, but it's connected and you are growing. That's, that's the point. We are changing. We can't not grow. It's just natural. That's what life does. Wherever you're at, you've got to believe, you've got to know that God is doing that in you. You are in his hand. You are growing just like Jesus in wisdom. You're growing in stature. You're growing in grace. And you're growing in favor with other people. In other words, you're going to build in your life things that bring good fruit. You're going to have relationships and you're going to have understanding and you're going to have abilities and skills. Those things are happening. And the third thing I wanted to mention is this idea of writing chapters, not books. And that's, I, most of you probably know that uh, my semi full time job is a, is a writer and a ghostwriter. And I've been involved with writing quite a few books. I've done some on my own, probably, I don't know, 15 or 20, and then helped edit quite a few more books as well. So I've, I've, I've worked a lot with the process of putting a book together. And one of the things that I've realized and that I tell people that are looking at writing a book is you don't write books, you build books, you write chapters. So you write a chapter and then another chapter and then another chapter and you build a book out of chapters. But no one writes a book. They're too big. I mean, maybe a children's book, but a full-size book, I mean, that's like 30, 40, 50,000 words. Some of them are way more than that. You don't just sit down and write a book, but you can write a chapter or you can write a section in a chapter. And what you actually do with book writing is you kind of work backwards. You reverse engineer the thing and you start with the idea and then you come up with a plan, how you're going to present the material, the idea that you have in your head, and then you divide it into an outline. You, you literally outline the book, turn it into a bunch of chapters, and then you attack the book. Okay, I'm gonna write this chapter, and then this chapter, and then that chapter, and yeah, throughout the process, everything changes 50 times. You redo your outline, you make changes, you, you realize you wanna go a different direction. That's totally normal. But you don't just sit down and say, I'm going to take on this overwhelming task. And yet, how often do we do that in our own lives in other areas? And we just think, oh, I'm just gonna do this. And we don't realize that this actually is made up of about 50 little pieces. And if we just do those pieces one after the other, sooner or later, we are going to accomplish this. So we look back over our lives and we like, look at the things that I built. Look at the ways that I changed. But it didn't happen because we did it in one day. It did it because day after day, we focused on the, the chapter or the stage or the step or the process that was right in front of us. And the kind of the funny thing is, that I, I think I've experienced this with probably every book I've worked on, about two thirds of the way through, you hate it. At about two thirds of the way through, or three fourths, you're just like, this is, this is tedious. I don't even know if it's a good idea. I don't think I wanna see it again. And I've just learned, you push through that. Sometimes it happens a few times. You push through those little roadblocks and you do get to the end of the journey and you look back and what you've created, what you've built is, is wonderful and it's part of you for the rest of your life. And you know, there's probably some area of your life that you are doing exactly what I'm describing right now. Maybe it is a book. Maybe you said, hey, well, I'm in, here on lockdown, I'm gonna write a book. If so, that's awesome. I'm super excited for you. But it's very possible it's not quite as tangible as a book. It might be something more internal. It might even just be your walk with God. And you might be thinking, how can I, how can I, how can I know God? How can I grow in God? How can I, understand the Bible. You know, maybe you've spent the last few weeks or months kind of growing closer to God and yet you, you see so many areas of your life that you, they're not where you want them to be and it can be intimidating. And again, it, we can kind of be our own worst enemies and begin to accuse ourselves or feel frustrated or guilty because we're not where we want to be. 
And I want you to think about just writing the chapter that you're looking at today. What's, what's the chapter of your life where God has you right now? Is it a chapter of education? Then study. Study well and enjoy it. You don't know your career. You can't figure it all out. I mean, try. But right now you're studying. Just enjoy that. It's a beautiful season. Maybe right now your chapter is small children at home. That is a beautiful, beautiful season. It's also an exhausting season, but it will never, there's no other season like that. Maybe it's a chapter of just enjoying your children and you have friends that are traveling the world, probably not right now, but they have been, or you have friends that are doing these amazing things on, online and you see them and you don't know why you're not. And, and it's because your chapter right now is your children. Maybe it's building a business. Maybe it's a health issue. Sometimes chapters don't feel like accomplishments. Sometimes chapters feel like survival. Sometimes chapters feel like I'm just doing this because no one else is doing it. I have no other choice. And you don't realize, but actually God is writing your story. And that I think is the big, the big idea in this is that we don't write our story. We live out those chapters. We live out those moments. But in all reality, the book of our life has been written by God. He knows what we're going to do. He knows where we're going. And that is exactly what allows us to rest and trust in him. That is what allows us to, to kind of just be slow in life. Slow in the sense of looking around and enjoying the journey. Slow in the sense of gratitude, <laughs> of just being grateful for the amazing things that we have and even celebrating what we've accomplished rather than just beating ourselves up or what we haven't accomplished or what we have yet to accomplish. It's, it's being able to say, I've, I have been faithful. I've done my best. I'm doing my best. And my life is in God's hands. And I want to finish just with a quick prayer. I don't know what season or chapter of life you might be living right now. I don't know if maybe there's some areas where you feel like you need to be going fast. And, and maybe that's, that is your season and that's great. But maybe God is actually asking you to, to slow down. Maybe God's asking you to look at your journey with a different perspective Realize that there are areas of your life that are growing. Maybe it's not what you thought should grow. Maybe it's not your money. Maybe it's not this or that. Maybe it's your character. Maybe it's your relationship with God. But the point is you are growing holistically. You are going far because God's called you. And every page that's written, every chapter that you go through in your life, God has you in his hands. Why don't we pray just to close this time? Lord, we thank you for your love and for your presence. Thank you that our lives are in your hands. God, I don't, I don't know what each one of us are going through, but you do. Lord, you see the, the challenges that we're facing and the challenges ahead. And Lord, we, just, we take a moment to just tell you, even thank you. We are grateful for all the seasons. We are thankful for all the times, for all the pages, all the chapters that we've lived and the ones that we're in right now. Lord, even though we might be facing some things that are challenging, we know, God, that you have our future in your hands. We're not giving up. This isn't going to end poorly. We're not going to lose, lose sight of the goal. God, we're, we're just going to hide ourselves in you. We are going to find ourselves in you. We're going to find our identity and our courage and our peace and our joy in the fact that you are leading us every step of the way. God, I pray for every person that's watching. If there's anybody out there that feels frustrated or discouraged with where they're at right now, if they feel guilty, if they feel condemned, if they feel angry, if they feel bitter, Lord, if they feel scared, maybe the future. I think those are all emotions that each one of us have felt at some point. God, we, we ask together. We just ask that you would fill us with your peace, that you would give us your grace and your faith as we look forward. We thank you, God, that the future is bright. Our future is in your hands. Lord, every day has been written out for us. And we know that you are, you are guiding us and you are helping us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as we did. Uh, I would like to remind you about our website, thehousegdl.com, where you can find the, uh, the rest of the videos. There's also links for online giving where you can contribute on tithes or offerings. Thank you so, so much for your generosity. We love you. We miss you. We're praying for you. And thank you so much again.